If you have your copy of God's Word, let's open up. As Jeremy said, we're going to be at the end of Romans 11, the beginning of chapter 12, and we're going to see the shift that takes place in this letter today. If you haven't been here, we've been walking through... Uh, the book of Romans in a series called Righteousness Revealed. And for the last 11 chapters, that's what we've seen, right? The, the righteousness revealed, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ put on full display as the Apostle Paul, like a, a master class, like an attorney in a courtroom, just, just displays the gospel in all of its glory. And in chapter 12, we get a shift. We start to, to get to practicality. We start to get to how this should impact our life. And so I want to start in Romans 12, 1. We're going to back up and finish up chapter 11, but I promise we will end up in chapter 12. Some of the folks from the first service were picking on me. They were like, you said we were going to end up in chapter 12, and it was like two minutes at the very end. I said, but did we get there? Yes. And it might just be two minutes at the very end, but I promise you we will get back to Romans 12, 1. Let's look at it. It says there, you'll probably whether you know it or not, have probably heard these verses if you've been in church at all throughout your life. Very famous as he's finished these first 11 chapters. And then he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, those two phrases that at least jump out to me, living sacrifices and our spiritual worship. As I studied and, and prayed and prepared, that, that idea, living sacrifice, took my mind to a, I've got you know, several bookshelves in my office, but there's certain books that I keep within arm's reach. Like the, the, these are ones that I go back to time and time again that I pull stories from, illustrations, you know, times when I'm struggling with something, I know I can go to these books for a specific thing, and there's one of them that's called 131 Christians Everyone Should Know. I got it way back in undergrad, and all it is is it's, you know, these little two to three page mini biographies of these Christians who have gone before, who lived incredible stories, examples of faith. God used them in tremendous ways throughout history, and there's one section, though, specifically that is just martyrs. Towards the back of the book, you have 10 to 12 stories of these believers' lives who were killed for their faith. And it's probably the section that I go to most often, especially when, when times get hard. Maybe I'm in a difficult season that I need some encouragement to see just the faith of some that have gone before. That have gone through way worse than whatever season or struggle it may be that I'm in. Some of them that have gone through the most horrific deaths you can imagine. Like thrown to packs of wild animals. Dismembered and mutilated. All for their faith. But the majority of the, the ones that are there were burned alive. And when I hear Romans 12.1, I think, right, right, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is a spiritual act of worship that I know it's to the most extreme instance, but you have these believers who they offered their bodies as literal sacrifices in that instance. Stories like that of Ignatius of Antioch, who said this, Now I begin to be a disciple. Let fire and cross Flocks of beasts, broken bones, and dismemberment come upon me so long as I attain to Jesus Christ. Like, that's easy to read, but can you imagine? Like, someone actually said that and then went through that. They're saying, no matter what, you want to crucify me? Fine. You want to set me on fire? You want to throw me to a bunch of lions? You, you want to cut off my body parts? You want to burn me at the stake? That's fine, because Jesus is worth it. Or how about Jan Hus, who was stripped naked, humiliated in front of all those around him, given an opportunity to recant, but before the fires were lit, he prayed this, Lord Jesus, it is for thee that I patiently endure this cruel death. And I pray thee to have mercy on my enemies. Can you imagine in that moment? 
Like the reality that you are going to be set on fire. And he's praying for his enemies. An unreal place of faith. Or how about Polycarp? Who when the Roman soldiers came to get him, his friends tried to get him to sneak out the back. They had an escape route. He said, no, 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 God's will be done. He opens the door to let the Roman soldiers in when he knows they're going to take him to his execution. As they try to nail him in place to the pyre, he stops them and says, you don't need to nail me in place. Like, how many of you have ever stuck your finger in a candle and how quickly we pull back, right? You stuck your hand on a burner before and how quick. You, You cannot just leave it there. And yet he's about to be a human candle lit on fire completely. And he goes, you don't have to nail me in place. He says, leave me as I am. For he who grants me to endure the fire will enable me to remain on the pyre unmoved without the security you desire with nails. The fire was lit. He prayed out loud. And he was consumed by the flames. All of those examples were from that book. Now you see why I go to that so often to be encouraged and challenged and convicted. To think of those instances. Real people. Real ordinary followers whose lives had been transformed by the gospel just like ours. And they ended up in those instances. And so I think, how do you do that? Like, How do you stand there? And, and be burned alive for your faith. Because here's the thing. It's not willpower. It's not just physical strength or courage or anything of themselves. Here's what I think it is. I think in a word it is worship. And you say, how can you get to that? Because they are showing in that instance that Jesus is worth anything. And so many times we have this misconception that worship is just what we did and only what we did. What we just did is an aspect of worship, of praising and and glorifying and honoring God through song. But it is so much more than just that. That it's easy to stand in here and to worship and to sing praise and honor and glory that is due his name. But what about out there? What about in situations of temptation? What about in opportunities to Deny or to lean in? Are we living lives that say he's worth it? Hebrews 12, 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. You, you want to so, know how people can stand in those instances like I just read about? When that fire that is God has totally consumed their heads and their hearts and their lives and their souls, and they know that he's worth it all. And so for us today, as we see this transition in Romans, I pray that it would also be a transition in in us. A time of showing, to to ask this question as we start, what is God shown to be worth in your life? That I doubt that any of us are ever going to be faced with being burned at the stake like I read about. But what are we showing him to be worth day in and day out? Uh, Worth it all? Whatever it takes, anything I could go through, whatever it would cost me. And the reason I start there is because I feel like when you see Romans 11 verses 33 through 36, where we're going to jump to to get us to Romans 12, 1, it is almost like for 11 chapters, Paul has been stoking this fire of theology. And at this point, it is just this raging inferno of doxology. You get that? That he's been taught, like, this is who God is. This is the glory of the gospel. This is what it means that we've been justified and we've been redeemed. And there's a propitiation. You know, all these big words and concepts that we've talked about. And it's like he just sits the pen down in the middle of it and just worships. Wow. At our God. How great he is. And I want us to see that solid theology should always lead to stronger doxology. The more we know about God, right, theology, studying him, knowing him, it should lead to more doxology, the worship of God. Like that, that should be the overflow. That the more we see and know and savor and come to understand of who he is and what he's done, it should overflow in a life of worship. R.C. Sproul, in his commentary on Romans 11, agrees He said that his professor in college used to always tell them, Gentlemen, all sound theology begins and ends with doxology. 
doxology simply meaning to, to, to sing, speak, or save the glory of God. As we're going to see, that, that, that's not just in rooms like this. We can, we can say that with our lives, can't we? We can show that and speak that in, in the way we worship Him and everything we say and do. Living sacrifices, spiritual worship. Let's back up and read it in this con- context of Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable or unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given to a gift to him that he might be repaid? Verse 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that that would be the case here in our time. That you would get the glory forever. But I I pray, God, that it would not end here. Or that you would get the glory forever in our lives. No matter the season, the circumstance, whatever may come our way, that you would receive the glory that you were due. And I pray, God, in this time that you would fan the flame of worship in our lives. That these truths and these realities that we're going to see from your word, God, that they would truly be fuel on the fire of worship to see who you are, what you've done, understand it a little bit more. God, may it overflow in worship. Praise, glory, honor. Do your name. God, move in this place. Be our teacher. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm calling the sermon Four Fuels for Our Worship. That if we're going to have that raging inferno, that fire that's overflowing in our lives, then, then there's got to be some fuel that's put on the fire. It's what I believe we see here in these final verses of Romans chapter 11. That with every one, I hope that it is just more fuel on the fire of worship. Seeing God, understanding, and it's stoking that in our life. So number one, I want us to see and understand that God has everything. Do we understand that? Very simple, and yet the depths of it, as we're going to see, we could never fully get to the bottom of it. That God has everything. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. It's a a hunting term there in unsearchable. He's meaning you can't get on his tracks and follow it out completely. You can never get to the end of it. The word there for inscrutable, it's unfathomable. Like you can't fully fathom the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge and the riches of our God. That he has everything. And the more we understand that, then hopefully the the deeper our worship will be. He he literally says there, O is in the Greek. Like that's not just thrown there in the English. Like he literally wrote, O, like, oh my gosh. And I like I'm I know I'm a very visual person. I can just imagine that he's written this, you know, eleven chapter theological treaty that is the first part of Romans. And I just imagine him just putting the pen down and stepping back and being overwhelmed in his humanity as he looks at God in all his glory. Oh my gosh. The depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, I, I can't fully fathom. I can't search it. Never knowing fully the depths of it. Like, I've never seen the Grand Canyon. We got any people that have seen the Grand Canyon? I've I've never heard a story of somebody coming back, seeing the Grand Canyon, and be like, nah, it's all right. They're always impressed. There's always this, oh, wow, moment. Kind of this shock and awe. And we, you've experienced situations like that, I'm sure, where that, that shock and that awe and that wonder, you know what I really think it is? It's our souls worshiping. Right? Like, To stand there in the room as the miracle of childbirth, like that's where my mind goes. I saw five of my children born and just sitting back and going, oh, wow, God. Like worship in that moment. That what God has created and done. He speaks and, and worlds are thrown into orbit. Do we fathom it? No, it's unfathomable, as he says. That we can never get to this, oh, he says, oh, the depths. 
that word depth, it's a kind of a picture many times in Scripture of the ocean. The depths of the sea, right? From, from the very beginning, humanity has had this kind of shock and awe and wonder at trying to get to the depths of the ocean. Throw into the deep, same word that Jesus uses there. And yet, even with our most modern technology, we saw it this year. It was one of the most famous news stories, right? The most modern submarine technology trying to go to the deepest, deepest parts of the ocean. And what happened? It, it killed them. And he's saying, look, we, we could never, like you, you can use it as an illustration, we can never get to the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of our God. And that's a good thing. And that should lead to worship and awe and wonder in us to, to play off of that illustration. If we took some of the, the bodies of water around us, we went over to Moss Lake, it has a max depth of about 80 feet, right, deep, if you were going to try to go down physically, but nothing compared to other bodies of water. We went over to Lake Norman. It has a depth of 130 feet. Deep, but still nothing compared to if we went to the deepest lake on earth. It's in Russia. It's named Lake Bacal. It has a max depth straight down of 5,387 feet. A mile straight down underwater. Like To try to fathom that, those depths. But even that compared to the deepest part of the ocean, if we were to go to the Pacific Ocean to a section called the Challenger Deep, there's a section that's not 5,000 feet deep. There's a section that's 35,000 feet deep. Almost seven miles straight down. Can, we can't wrap our minds around that, can we? I, I, did the, I, I ran a little GPS this morning. From here to Gardner-Webb University is right at seven miles. Like to put it in context, if this was the diving board and we just dumped off, jumped off from this stage and you started swimming, not straight across, but straight down for seven miles, that's the depth of the deepest part of our ocean. And even that is just scratching the surface of a picture of the depths of our God. That it is an ocean that is just keeps going and going and going and going. And for us, the, the picture and the phrase that I've been using for the last two weeks as I've studied this, us understanding, trying to understand the depths of God would be like trying to take the Pacific Ocean and put it into a thimble, right? And even, you might think, man, I'm, I'm wise and I'm smart, but, but even you, you might be the size of a thumb thimble over a pinky thimble, but still, we're all thimbles, we can get a couple drops, but nothing compared to the knowledge, the wisdom, the riches, the glory. You can't plumb to the depths. That when it comes to his riches, he owns everything. Verses, he says this all throughout scripture, but verses like Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belongs what? Belongs heaven and the heavens of heaven, the earth and all that is in it. Just sit in that silence for a minute. That, that as the nation of Israel is being told that, it's being told in the context of, hey, I want you to see how big God is, and I want you to understand that even as big as he is, he still loves you and chose you. That's what he's saying in Deuteronomy 10. Hey, he owns heaven and the heavens of heaven, the earth and everything in it, and still loves you. Verses like Psalm 50, where he tells us, Verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. When it comes to riches, when it comes to material, he created, he spoke it into existence. He owns it all. When it comes to knowledge and wisdom, listen, he knows everything and applies it perfectly. It's hard for us to wrap our little thimble minds around that, isn't it? A.W. Tozer put it well when he said this, God cannot learn. He never at any time or in any manner received into his mind knowledge that he did not possess and had not possessed from eternity. Because God knows all things perfectly, he knows no thing better than another thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything, he is never surprised, nor is he ever amazed. Quotes like that kind of hurt my mind, right? Right? Kind of hurt my brain to think about it. Like I, I feel like I'm a pretty smart guy, but even that's like, I can't comprehend it. It doesn't compute, right, to think that he knows everything perfectly. 
And, and to me, you know, there's so many times where stuff's going on and I feel like I'm praying to God to inform him about a situation. Anybody else? Guess what? You've never informed God of something he wasn't fully aware of. There's never been a situation where things are going wrong and you're just like, God, you got to know this. And he's like, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Like, I don't know what I would do if you hadn't let me know that. It slipped my mind. I'm sorry, it won't happen again. I'll get right on it. That's never happened. He knows. In control. Like even in that, like in that moment, that brings peace to my soul. Like if I fully believe that, that brings a calm over me, even as I stand here to preach. And he knows perfectly. You're not informing him. You're not counseling him. As it says here, who has ever counseled the Lord? You haven't. I haven't. Augustine has it, Paul has it, none of the greatest minds, theologians, people that have ever, nobody has. Because he has everything. This should do something to us, right? Like that should be enough. I could stop, I could just pray right now, and that should be enough to erupt worship in our souls. Like this should change how we live. Like we could apply just this point. This should change how we act, and this should change what we ask. Just real quick, a couple points of application. This should change how we act. It should remove anxiety. And this should change what we ask. It should create dependency. Think about that. If he has everything, knows perfectly, then why are you anxious? Why are you freaking out? Because you don't believe it. Because if we did, we would live differently. We would trust and obey. We would sleep in peace, knowing that he's running the universe and we don't have to. Isn't that comforting? Like to, to, to apply it, my kids, when we go out to eat, first off, how many of you have ever worried about finances? Anybody, raise your hand, willing to not be a liar, right? We've worried about finances. But just to make a very practical illustration, when we go into restaurants, guess how many times my kids have looked at the prices on the menu? Zero. They're not looking at the prices. They're not trying to crunch some numbers during the middle of the meal to make sure we're able to cover the tab when it comes time to settle up, are they? Not worried about it at all. They're looking at what they want. They're, they're trying to, to meet the physical need of their hunger or whatever it might be. They're going to enjoy it. Why? To make up a phrase, they have very good dadology. They know their dad's going to pay for it. Like they know that, that, that I'm going to, to provide in that instance for my family. They've never laid awake at night in their rooms going, man, how are we going to pay this mortgage? Where, where are we going to come up with the money for the insurance for all these cars and the braces and the college and all those things? They, they've never thought one thing about it because of their view of their dad. And yet how sad is it that my kids many times have more faith in me than I have in God? I don't own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't have the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. This should change how we act. This should remove anxiety that our Heavenly Father's got it. And He loves us more than we could ever imagine. It should change what we ask. It should create dependency. Pride keeps us from asking. Pride thinks we have to figure it out. Pride and arrogance thinks, man, I'll come up with the plan. Instead of looking at verses like this and let it create real deep humility. You have it. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to keep asking you. Over and over and over again, the, the great hymn writer John Newton once said, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. We glorify God with our petitions. We glorify God with dependency. Showing, I need you. I'm trusting in you. God has everything which flows into the next fuel for the fire. And that God needs nothing is number two. Like it logically carries on that if he has everything, then he needs nothing. But it's here in the text as well, I believe. He, he says, how unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? 
Who's been his counselor? Has he needed any input, wisdom, knowledge, counsel from, from any of us? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? The answer for all of these rhetorical questions is emphatically no one. Has no need. We will never meet a deficiency in God with anything we do because there was no deficiency in God. Right? Our giving is not meeting a need of His. Our worshiping is not meeting a need of His. It's actually for our good. It is a gift that He's given us to glorify and give back to Him because it's all from Him. Like that's what we begin to see when we plumb the depths of these theological truths. He needs nothing. Now, those questions there. They're from other passages of Scripture. One is in Isaiah chapter 40. The other is in Job chapter 41. He's pulling in these Old Testament con- contexts to show that God has been the same. He's never needed anything. In, in the Isaiah passage, it's when Israel is going into a Babylonian captivity. And God tells them in the middle of that, Hey, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We love that verse. So many times we miss that it's in the context of them going into captivity. And in the middle of it, God goes, I've still got you. You can trust me. The other in Job is when Job has finally began to question God. And Job, yeah, he had a rough season. He went through some crazy stuff, but he begins to question God. And God, in his infinite wisdom, knowledge, power, love, begins to question back. Look at this, Job 38, verse 1, this entire section from Job 38 to 41. God begins to rattle off questions for Job. He looks at him and he says, Okay, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I've got some questions for you that you're going to need to answer, Job. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You could just stop right there, right? Crickets. Theology. God's creator. It should lead to humility. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Oh, that's right. You weren't created yet because I created you. So bring some humility. Brace yourself. He continues. Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions? Who stretched out the surveying lines? Who supports its foundations? Who laid its cornerstones as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And then for 70 plus questions, he continues in that stream of thought. And with each question, you know what should happen? God should seem bigger and we should seem smaller. That's a good thing. For us to seem smaller in comparison to him. To stand out, you ever stood out under the night sky and just looked up at stars and, and hopefully it led to you feeling smaller? See galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies and, and stars upon stars upon stars. And if it did, then we could come back to Job 38 verse 31 where he asked Job, Can you direct the movements of the stars? Can you direct the constellations through their seasons? Do you know the laws of the universe? No, no, no. But God does. Has everything. Needs nothing. This should fuel the fire of our worship for Him. And then number three, it should go to another level in that we see God gives generously. That in that He has everything, He needs nothing, and still loves us enough to give generously. For God so loved the world that He did what? He gave His one and only Son. That we see this beauty in the gospel that what God did for sinners like us. That he would give generously. Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. The greatest giver the universe could ever know. He, He gives generously. Again, Tozer puts it well when he says an elementary but correct way to think of God is of the one who contains all, who gives all that is given, but who himself can receive nothing that he has not first given. Again, hurts my brain to think in those quotes. But I think a, a simple illustration that can help us understand that is it is Christmas season, right? We're, we're getting shopping and seeing the movies and all the music that's around. And on Christmas morning, 
My kids are going to sit me down on the couch or on a chair, and they're going to go to different parts of the house where they have these gifts hidden that they have purchased for me, and then they're going to bring all of these gifts, and they're going to watch in excitement as I open the gifts that they've given me. But where did the money come from to buy those gifts? My bank account, right? They, they might have used their mom to use a car, but still it's connected to my money. And we get that and we know that and we think it's cute and cuddly when it's in that illustration. But how can we not see whenever it comes to anything with God, we're the little kid. And he's the one that's given everything. And everything that we're giving back to him is just something that he had to begin with and gave us to use. From, through, to, all things are from him. C.S. Lewis used that illustration in Mere Christianity. He wrote about it. He said, every faculty you have, like, think about this. This is true for every single person in this room. This is not one that you can just defer to someone else. Every faculty you have, your power of thinking, of moving your limbs from moment to moment, is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not, in a sense, his own already. So that when we talk of a man doing anything for God or giving anything to God, I'll tell you what it's really like. And then he uses the Christmas illustration. He said it's like a small child going to his father and saying, Daddy, give me six pence to buy you a birthday present. Of course the father does. He's pleased with the child's present. It's all very nice and proper, but only an idiot would think that the father is six pence to the good on that transaction. There's not any positive to him. It all came from him. And this is the, the point. Don't miss this. When a man has made these two discoveries, then God can really get to work. It is after this that real life begins. The man is now awake. Only an idiot would think that the father is six pence to the good. And yet so many times we live like idiots. Thinking, I did this for God. I, I, I'll meet that for you, God. Look at what I did for God. No. <laughs> for all the little kids. And when we get it, that's when God can get to work. That it's all from him. Through him and should be to him. Which leads to the final point. God deserves the glory. Like this should be the fuel. When you see it's... He has everything. He needs nothing. He's given generously. God deserves the glory. And when I say he deserves it, I mean all of it. Like to think in the context of this, right? Remember, he's talking coming directly out of Romans 9 through 11, which is this just deep dive into the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinful mankind. To think of the greatest gift that God has given us is the gospel. That he sent his one and only son. That Jesus took our place. That we could be redeemed. That we could be justified. That we could have the covering that Jesus' blood provides. That's the immediate context. The only right response is glory, is it not? The only logical response that we could have is to say, God, you deserve this. That's how he concludes. To him be glory forever. Period. Amen. Period. End of story. Nothing else deserves glory. I know that can be a blow to our egos. You don't deserve glory. Spouse doesn't. Your kids don't. Jobs, possessions, pursuits. None of it is meant to be glorified. He deserves it. All of it. Now, Psalm 96, 8 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. And I love the way the New Living translates it. It says, Give the Lord the glory he deserves. For us, as we begin to wrap this up, to think of what things are we glorifying? What things are we honoring and praising and pursuing that aren't worth it? That don't deserve our worship. Because here's the thing, like we, we all worship something, no matter what. You just might be worshiping something that doesn't deserve it. God is the one alone who does. And to, to wrap this up from where we began with the opening illustration, giving glory to God is so much more than just the words we sing in a room like this. In just a moment, we're going to sing songs. And I do. I want you to sing from the depths of your soul. Maybe from some of you, I want you to, to sing and give glory, maybe like you never have before in a room. 
to let go, to lift your hands, to sing praises that he is worthy of. But it cannot stop in here. Right? That's where we get to this transition. Romans 12 is that shift that I talked about in the beginning. That he's going, he's poured out this theology, now it's the practicality. It goes, hey, this is what we believe, but what we believe should affect how we behave. Amen? That this is the reality of a holy God who has saved us when we didn't deserve it, then there should be application from that education. That yes, theology should be overflowing into doxology, but I also want us to see before we leave that it should overflow in sanctity as well. That sanctity, holy, right living, being separated from sin. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, but that should be an overflow as well. Therefore, my brothers, in view of the mercy of God, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I'll say it a lot, I'll say it again, I'll keep saying it. What's the therefore, therefore? Everything that has preceded this. Therefore, in view of the mercies of God that I've laid out in the last 11 chapters, Paul says, the only right response is to offer your bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to God. Only right response. When it says this is your spiritual worship, that that word there, that phrase, it means it's the only reasonable, logical explanation and response that we could have. He gave it all for you, then how could we not live for him? It would make no sense otherwise. And to say that this is what should happen. Holy and pleasing, it says. And once we've believed and received the gospel, we don't get to just continue living any way we want to. We might try to, but that is not the heart of a disciple. I heard Howard Hendricks speaking of this. He said the problem with it being a living sacrifice is that we're constantly wanting to crawl off the altar. Probably seen that, felt that in your life. God brings some conviction. You know there needs to be an area of repentance, and instead of dying to sin, dying to self, pursuing and honoring God, we just try to crawl off the altar in that area. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to be a living sacrifice. Romans 6.1 told us, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? That's what we see here in Romans 12.1. Be living sacrifice. Just think of that phrase together. A living killing. An alive death. That's the picture of the Christian life. You want to know what it looks like? It's to... I'm alive tomorrow, dying to self. That I'm alive to Christ and I'm dying to sin. Killing it, crucifying it. Being renewed and remade as I pursue Him day in and day out. In every part of our lives. Leading to repentance, holiness. This is a reasonable service. And to realize that that we need to to, to glorify Him. And this should come from a spirit of gratitude for all He's done. Like that, When He says that, this is reasonable. This is logical. This is the only response should be gratitude. Do you realize what He's done in the gospel? That J.I. Packer put it this way. He said, the driving force in authentic Christian living is, ever must be, not the hope of gain, but a heart of gratitude. That's it. It's coming before a holy God and realizing how unworthy we are, what he's done, and this heart of gratitude just wants to live in worship. I'm not here for gain. Like we couldn't work and earn it. It's not out of guilt. It's out of a heart of gratitude for all that God has done in the gospel. Is that fuel on the fire of your heart? He who has been forgiven little loves little. But he who's been forgiven much loves much. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Hopefully that reality setting in of how much you've been forgiven in Christ. If you are in him, you are a new creation. Behold, the old is past and new has come. Praise God, that should bring some gratitude. 
Because I know the old that I was. And I know my heart and I know my mind. I know what I've done. I know where I've been. I know what I've looked at. I know what I've said. And yet he doesn't look at that anymore. He looks at the righteousness of Christ. (laughs) Praise God. The debt's been paid. (laughs) Praise God. He has everything. Needs nothing. Has given so generously. Deserves all the glory. How could we not respond in worship? So in this moment before we sing, I just want to read the words. to something that Francis Havergill wrote hundreds of years ago. But I think it encompasses what a a living sacrifice should look like, what our prayers should be this morning. As she wrote, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips, let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Yes, take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. I pray that would be our prayers today. Father, in view of your mercy, God, I pray that we would present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you. You're worthy. I praise your name. I pray that you would be honored and glorified by the, the praises that we lift in this time, God, but I pray that you would be honored and glorified by the lives we live the rest of this week. The responses that we have, the repentance that we show, the grace and generosity that we give, God, that you would live through us as we are your living sacrifices. In Jesus' name.